You're very welcome to today's update. Now, I hadn't planned on making this talk at all. I had something completely different in mind. But I've had lots and lots of complaints from, from many of you about this. And here it is here. So this is the video I did yesterday where we compared Pfizer's new COVID medication and we suggested it shares uh, pharmacodynamics. That's the mechanism of action or modal modality of action with uh, ivermectin. And I actually went to quite a lot of trouble on, on this paper. I actually went to did quite a lot of uh, background reading on it and I think I gave evidence that it was a similar modality of action or at least to one of the modalities of action of ivermectin. And yet many of you who, who kindly posted the link from my video got this on Facebook. So we'd clearly been um, independent fact checkers. Oh, so, OK, so this could mislead people. See why. So let's indeed uh, see why and see what we make of it, as many of you have asked me to do. So uh, see why takes you through to this link here. Uh, sci check, or oh, this sci, sci, it sounds scientific, doesn't it? Uh, Factcheck.org. Uh, so and, and here's the full article here, uh, quite detailed. Now, in the past, when I've been fact checked, I've actually had uh, bespoke articles uh, made out just addressing my videos, which I was quite flattered about, to be quite honest. And we have looked at those in the past, but this one's much more generic in, in nature. So let's uh, let, let's just look at this briefly. Um, so the article is called uh, Merck Pfizer COVID-19 antivirals differ d different from ivermectin. OK, so we, we will be saying yes and no to parts of that. So how our independent fact checkers selected on Facebook is interesting. So there's a bit of blurb on that there. And actually, if you go on to the site here, um, this is all public domain. This is live straight live from the Facebook uh, links. You can actually see the fact checkers and who they are. So I'm not going to go into the details of the uh, the personalities of the people that are actually uh, writing this and this is attributed to one author it's easy to find out just click on it and, and you can find the link um, but let's look at who they are so first of all um, this one um, I'm not going to go through the names as I've said they're there if you want them the first one is a journalist so here we have one of the fact checkers is a journalist and uh, it tells you about the background of this journalist it didn't look particularly scientific to me uh, now, the next fact checker, um, the, the, these people that uh, are arbitrate what is true for, for, the, for, for the hoi polloi like you and me who, who can't really tell the difference. It, it's really good that these people are able to tell us what is fact from fiction and what's facts and what's alternative facts. So uh, oh, the second one's a journalist as well. So uh, that one's a journalist also. Uh, this next one is a professor of communication. So professor of communication. Now, Strange thing to be a professor of, I would have thought, communication, but, but there you go. Um, but it's not medicine, is it? And it's not science. So it's how you communicate with people, I guess. I'm not really sure what communication means in that context. But oh, the next one's a journalist. Um, so that one's a journalist. Uh, this one's a journalist. This one's in a, form, a former assignment editor. So I, I assume that's kind of like a senior journalist. I don't really know. This next one, now this is the only one actually is a science journalist and, and actually the, the, the person that uh, critiqued, uh, or not critiqued, but did the comment we're about to look at is actually a qualified uh, a PhD level scientist. But that was the only one in the list who I could see was a proper scientist. So we'll give her a tick. Uh, this other one, one earned a BA in journalism. A BA, well, not, lots of people have BAs. I mean, I've got one myself. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, many of you watching will have a, a, a Bachelor of Arts degree. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're quite uh, they're quite common. It's no particular big deal. Um, just a bit of work or well, quite a bit of work. <laughs> Mine was. But, uh, but, you know, it's not it's not that impressive. Uh, the next peer reviewer here worked as a reporter. Uh, I guess that's a kind of journalist um, is a graduate of the School of Journalism. So it's a journalist. Uh, is a journalist so it, it looks like the new arbiters of truth who, who keep the likes of you and me informed are, are, are mostly journalists and, and a professor of communication uh, and, and a former assignment editor and editor and one of those is a um, one of those is a sign is a science a qualified scientist who is now a journalist 
So these are the people that decide for, for us kindly um, what is true and what is not, what are the facts and what aren't the facts. So um, just to remind us, um, factcheck.org, this is, this is the logos they put out. Sci-check Digest. So, so what we have here is we have a group of how many people that I read out there? I don't know, about eight of them or nine of them or ten of them or something. And, and one is a scientist, and yet these are the Sci-check Digest. So I guess Sci is the first three letters of science. So I guess that's what they mean. So anyway, what are they saying? Uh, the pills are very different from the anti-parasitic medication Ivermectin. So just uh, reminding us that Ivermectin is an anti-parasitic medication, which we already knew, of course. But the pills are very different. Now, I assume from this they mean the Molnupiravir capsules. Uh, we don't know if the new Pfizer one is a pill or a capsule yet or not. This is the new Pfizer one here, which we looked at. And th th this, is, this is quite normal to have a, a sort of a research name here on this. It is the investigational medication is a protease inhibitor. And we, we know we looked at protease inhibitors because we gave evidence that ivermectin was a protease inhibitor. That blocks a key enzyme in the SARS coronavirus 2 vi virus uh, needed to replicate itself. And this was it here, in fact. This was our um, three uh, chymotryptin-like protease that cut up the long proteins into shorter proteins. In fact, I think I might still have the true flying around here. Yep, here we are. Um, so here we had um, a long protein that was cut into two shorter proteins by uh, my pair of scissors. I mean by the three uh, chymotryptin <laughs> protease. But we couldn't now because it's inhibited. It's inhibited by this bit of tape on the end that stops it working. That's the protease inhibitor. So uh, that's what we did yesterday. And, and then we get a logo as we go down, um, just to remind us that this is a scientific process. Here we are. Here it is. Here, look. So we get this uh, side check, just in case we'd forgotten this is a scientific process as we go down. Now, first of all, Molnupiravir, which we talked about a few days ago. Um, roughly about 50% efficacy of people keeping, people out, keeping people out of hospital. Right. While the results of... Um, well, the results have not been published in a peer review, so they haven't. So these are not. This is not a peer-reviewed medication they're talking about. They were compelling enough for the trial's independent data monitoring committee to recommend an early halt to the recruitment in the study. Now, many of you, in your feedback, said, given that this is a new antiviral, it might have been better just to let the study run for a bit longer, because this is a single study. And the Med Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Authority in the UK seem to have approved Molnupiravir on the basis of one, which you could say truncated, um, clinical study, which amazed me, actually. Uh, quite, I found that quite incredible that they'd approved that on the grounds of a, 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 a semi-completed study so quickly. Food and Drug Administration in the States, uh, they're, they're considering the application on the 30th of November, so that's going to be a bit more time yet. Now, molnupiravir is a nucleoside analogue. So that, that, in other words, it's similar to one of the bases in RNA, the four bases in RNA. A drug that mess. Now, this is a direct quote from the from this. Uh, uh, this is a direct quote from this uh, scientific uh, report, um, and it's a drug that uh, uh, messes up viral replication by tricking the virus into using the process medication as one of its building blocks for its genetic code. This, let's be clear, this is a completely utterly different modality of the function of ivermectin and we were quite clear about that uh, when we recorded the video on this no ambiguity it's nothing to do with ivermectin modality working completely different ways so they are correct the capsules of molnupiravir work in a completely different way giving more information about molnupiravir the the uh, this this paper goes on or this article whatever you want to call it goes on um, this is what's known as error catastrophe using a mechanism called lethal mutagenesis. So uh, error catastrophe. So it, it, these these dodgy bases are put in and uh, it causes lethal mutations. A, a mutation is a change in the genetic material of a cell or in this case a virus. We, we hope it's a virus. Um, lethal mutagenesis. Now that sounds absolutely fantastic if that is the virus that's being affected. I don't like the sound of error catastrophe or lethal mutagenesis if it's affecting human cells. And I have said that even though the MHRA has recommended this and that even though the uh, the 
press release, and it is a press release from Merck, said that this wouldn't be a problem. Uh, I'm waiting for the peer-reviewed data on that before I make my judgment. Not so I can make a judgment, not that I'm so smart I can judge from the peer-reviewed literature, but when it's published in a peer-reviewed data or a peer-reviewed journal, millions of doctors and scientists around the world can, can review it and will get not just one or two opinions, but literally a million or two million or three million or four million or ten million informed opinions from doctors and scientists around the world. Until then, I am not going... Um, I, and until then, I don't have the rationale to explain why the Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Agency in the UK made the decision they made. So we'll wait for that. Although both drugs are novel... Uh, with news of these development, people on social media are spreading false notions that the pills are the same or suspiciously similar to ivermectin. Well, again, we've said that one probably has the same mechanism of action. One doesn't. So, I mean, I don't see that I've said anything wrong so far to get this uh, fact check. Anyway, some iterations of the claim uh, incorrectly posit that Pfizer's drug is based on ivermectin, that the two are essentially the same because they are both protease inhibitors. Well, as far as I understand it, I gave a lot of evidence that they... Uh, were both protease inhibitors. Um, so um, the we, we we know that the uh, that the new Pfizer drug is a protease inhibitor because the uh, the press release tells us. So it must it must be it must be right. Um, so that's protease inhibitors. Uh, something that's not been established, even if it's true, doesn't mean the drugs are similar. So this this fact check article is telling us that it's not been established. It's not been established that ivermectin is a protease inhibitor. And even if it's true, it doesn't mean the drugs are similar. Well, if it is true, actually, it does mean the drugs are similar because it means they work in the same way. <laughs> it means that they both uh, inhibit three uh, chymotryptin-like uh, protease. Must do because the scissors are stuck. So, so um, yeah, OK. Now, I don't want to disappear down a rabbit hole here, but we, 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 we let, let's go with this argument because it has, it has got some validity. Now, the paper... It's talking about here a, a, a com, computational model paper published by some Indian scientists. So this is this is only published by some Indian scientists. So it's probably I'm, I'm sure there's no implication there that just because it's published by Indian scientists it's less valid. Um, but it's just written in a funny way. Um, but the, the the author of this is right that these are uh, mostly in silico analyses, molecular modelling. Uh, and, and she says, however, this does not show that ivermectin acts as a protease inhibitor in SARS coronavirus 2 through any sort of biological experiment. It only proposes the possibility based on computer simulations. Well, this is essentially true. So she is quite correct to point this out. The examples we gave were based on um, detailed computer modeling uh, events. But... There is th 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 this this paper here. Have I put that one up? No, I'm not sure. If, yeah, I think I think that's that one. Is it um, drugs shown to inhibit SARS kind of? Yeah, yeah. I th um, yeah, I think that's that one. Um, that one there. Um, that paper there, which we've looked at in the past. Um, so this um, th 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 this one actually tells us. Um, it, talking about ivermectin as a repurpose of, as a therapeutic agent for COVID-19 after in vitro studies, that, that is in in, uh, in test tube studies, uh, which were criti criticised for not having, showed that uh, there's a 5,000-fold inhibition of sars coronavirus 2 The debate here is about the concentration, of course. But so, so while the uh, author of this critique is right in saying that um, there is no in vitro, true evidence of this precise modality of action there is other in vitro evidence of uh, antiviral activity so we could i guess we could give a half for that now the mechanism of action of ivermectin against sars coronavirus through an evidence-based critical review journal of antibiotics now this is from the journal of antibiotics uh, which we have here so that's from this article here, Journal of Antibiotics, 15th of June, 2021. Looks like, um, well, it is a pretty thorough article. Now, what this one is saying, um, th th this article, while it doesn't give any new evidence, it's basically reviewed the literature and seems to accept 
It seems to accept that um, ivermectin is a uh, 3CL inhibitor. One such en enzyme, 3 chymotryptin like protease inhibitor, is responsible for working on this polyprotein, which is the long protein that's chopped into smaller bits so it fits into the virus, causing other proteins to liberate and carry out viral replication. Ivermectin binds to this enzyme and disrupts it. So th th this paper here um, basically seems to accept it. Now, wh while it is true that this is based on in silico analysis, it seems to be accepted by the Journal of Pharmacology, but I'm happy to concede the point that the data for ivermectin being a protease inhibitor, although multiple multiple studies have shown this, they are simulation studies. But this is what you would expect with molecular function. So if we take another molecule, for example, if we take this molecule here, PF0732133, oh, come to think of it, that's the new ivermectin, that, 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 that's the new um, Pfizer medication, isn't it? So the new Pfizer medication, the very medication itself, um, the way that we know or the way the only way that's in the public domain that we know this is a protease inhibitor is from you've guessed it in computer in silico modeling uh exploration the binding mechanisms of the new pfizer medication sars coronavirus 2 protease inhibitor through molecular dynamics and building free energy simulations and the crystalline structure of i guess that kind of means the 3d structure really the crystalline structure of the uh, 3CL protease inhibitor in the in, in complex with this one, the, the new Pfizer drug, uh, are not yet available. Therefore, the docked complex of, in other words, the combination of the new drug and the uh, and and this, the protease inhibitor, was generated using molecular operating environment software. So <laughs> that's kind of in the in the same uh, in the same boat, really. So I guess. If this drug was a person, would say to it, people in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. So um, that's where we are with that. So it, it, it's a partly valid criticism. I think it's a partly valid criticism, but I, I don't think it, it, it alters my fundamental contention that ivermectin, one of its functions, according to these phar pharmacodynamic in silico studies, is that it functions as a 3CL protease, chymotryptin-like protease inhibitor. Now, just a few interesting bits from this before we finish. I'm not going to go on today. Um... Looks like Merck is repackaging a horse drug and, and making it much more expensive. It will be the new treatment for coronavirus in pill form. Now, that's a quote from this article. Um, so that's kind of putting up what's being said on social media. Now, th this is what we call, um, I guess this is what you call a straw man argument. You put up an argument that people are saying that you can easily knock down like a straw man. So it's not too difficult to... I'm not sure where they, why they call it a horse drug, though. I'm, I really don't know why that happens, given that ivermectin has been given to 3.7 billion doses of ivermectin have been given to human beings it's funny horses are given antibiotics some of the same antibiotics are given to humans and we don't we don't say oh well you know i went to the doctor today and he gave me a horse drug he gave, he gave me a moxicillin it's a horse drug no it's a human drug <laughs> horses happen to take it as well it's really just bizarre it's really quite bizarre the Food and Drug Administration has warned people against self-medication with uh, easier to access formulations of ivermectin for livestock, which are highly concentrated and also may include other ingredients that have not been tested in people. Absolutely, we agree. Totally, absolutely. That gets lots of ticks. Completely correct. And I believe we've actually said this many times on, on, on our, our videos. So I'm not quite sure why being fact checked on that particular point. As a result, there is no basis for claiming that either the Pfizer or Merck drug are similar to ivermectin in any way. Well, yes, the Merck drug, it's not similar in any way. Uh, the, uh, the Pfizer drug does seem to be a protease inhibitor. So uh, I, I would give that, uh, I'll give that statement five out of ten if I was marking this paper. Pfizer also denies any connection. This is a spokesman. This is a spokesman from Pfizer, according to this article. Also denies any uh, connection. Pfizer protease inhibitor is not similar to that of animal medicine. I wonder what animal medicine they're talking about there. And I wonder why a Pfizer spokesman is calling a drug that's been given 3.7 billion doses to humans in animal medicine, if he is indeed referring to ivermectin. That's a bit strange, that. If you want to come on the channel and explain that, of course, you're very welcome. Um, a company spokesman said in an email, very strange thing to say. 
uh, the post uses the phrase uh, Pfizer mectin. Some you one on me, but um, anyway, that that's um, that's actually a direct quote from this <laughs> from this uh, from this critique, which I thought was was quite interesting. Um, yeah, that 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 last article I showed you from uh, the where where that new medication works in the has been the, the modality of action has been analysed in the same way is there. That's that paper there. So I think I've given as much evidence as I can on that. Um, now, in full disclosure, that they do claim that um, editors note side check COVID nineteen. Vac slash vaccination project is made possible by a grant from the Robert Johnson Wood Foundation. Johnson, that, that name's familiar. I think that's the same Johnson as started Johnson & Johnson, the huge international pharmaceutical company. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure it is. Now, um, there we go. So, uh, am I a bit annoyed about being fact-checked? Well, maybe, I suppose you could. You could say that. Uh, no, not really. We, we, it's not. It's not annoying. It's, it's just. It's just a big giving argument and counter argument, which of course I'm always happy to receive. So um, hopefully that's clarified the position on that. Now, um, it's not that I'm mischievous or naughty, but I'm just going to give you one fact before we finish this analysis. Uh, final fact. And this is not an alternative fact. This is a genuine fact. <laughs> Mulno Puravia, um Molnopiravir. Now I think I didn't. I don't think I meant Molnopiravir there. I think I, I think I think I meant flu flu voxamine. I'll, I'll check on that tomorrow. But flu vox flu voxamine, the antidepressant we've looked at, also has flu flu three fluorine atoms, as does the new medication there. I'm pretty sure I meant flu in there. I put the wrong drug. But that's just me being a uh, being mischievous to point out that there's a similarity between the new Pfizer drug and uh, flu voxamine, which I'm not qualified to speak on but I, I'm pretty sure they both do have three fluorine atoms not that that means that much really to be quite honest so there, there we go um, quite a few of you asked me to do that I hope that helps um, I think I think the thing is you know um, the idea that some people set them I think the thing that's a bit annoying really is some people are sort of setting themselves up over the rest of us as fact checkers and we have to sort of sit at their feet and saying, oh, thank you for distributing a few facts. Um, I guess that's the current uh, big tech phase we are in. So a bit of a left field <laughs> video today. Uh, let, 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 let's listen to uh, Richard in London, who's going to give us a report. Richard, thank you very much, Richard. Hello, Dr. Campbell. This is Richard in central London. I've just got back from my booster jab only an hour ago at a University College Hospital in central London. And uh, it was a Pfizer jab. Um, it has been exactly six months since my second uh, jab, which were both AstraZeneca. Um, I was in uh, group six, which is uh, the vulnerable group because I had an out of hospital cardiac arrest because of my Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. You can describe to your viewers what that is if you like. Um, and a successful ablation, but it is monitoring me, so I'm in group six, which is fine. Um, and so I went in and uh, everything was in order and I asked the nurse whether she could aspirate uh, the needle. And she said uh, she'd never done that kind of thing before. Um, and then she asked with a smirk, have you been reading things on the internet? Um, and I said, well, yes, that and the Lancet and the British Medical Journal and other locations and that seemed to um, uh, <laughs> pipe her down a little bit. And so she said, OK, uh, she will go ahead and aspirate. And so uh, I believe she did. But foolishly, I've got a bit of a nervous thing with needles. And so every time a needle goes in, I always look away. And so I didn't actually watch to see if she did actually aspirate or whether she said she would and, you know, did it behind my back, but literally. Um, but, uh, it seemed to be very quick, but, uh, I trust her and I presume that it was aspirated, but yes, but there was a, there was an energy that suggested that I was, you know, a bit of a tinfoil hat wearing nutcase for, uh, even thinking that an aspiration was needed. And also a little bit weird that this, I was the only person who's ever asked her, but, uh, it's been, 
It's been an hour now, as I say, and I'm feeling fine. Um, having had AstraZeneca and then uh, having a Pfizer afterwards, I've been warned that there might be um, some side effects for a couple of days, and they suggested having paracetamol. But I remember uh, a long time ago you mentioning that uh, having paracetamol and cooling the body temperature down isn't necessarily the best thing to do when the body is trying to pull its temperature up to a fever-like state to be able to um, fight the virus. Um, but maybe you can elaborate more on that after this. And so, yes, just thank you, um, Dr. Campbell, for all of your videos. I've been following them faithfully uh, since the start of this hell. And so um, I wish you all the best and please make more videos. Thank you. Thanks so much, Richard. Um, really, really very, uh, really very uh, eloquent uh, report. Um, very, con very concisely put, it must be said. So thank you for that. So, so Richard had this condition called, uh, well, he had an out of hospital arrest, so pretty serious. I'm just so pleased that there was facilities there to, to resuscitate you fully, Richard. That's brilliant. Wolf Parkinson White is where the, the impulses go from the top of the heart. Uh, and they go through to the bottom as they're supposed to. But then there's another pathway which allows the impulse to go from the bottom chambers of the heart back up to the top. So instead of just getting an impulse going through every every uh, 70 times a minute or whatever it is, you actually get one going through, then it goes back quickly. So you get a very quick recycling. And that means that the ventricles are stimulated very quickly and that can cause this uh, condition called ventricular fibrillation. So delighted you've had that ablated. Uh, the, the pathway for that will have been ablated by the cardiologist. So it's it's just basically won't exist anymore. I, th I think Tony Blair had something similar when he was a prime minister, actually. So really pleased that that's worked out well. The idea about the paracetamol, um, I think what we have to understand is fever is the body's natural response to a uh, to an infection. Or in this case, I guess, to the immunological response generated by a vaccine and um we should think carefully before we uh, obliterate the body's natural physiological responses to anything, whether that's inhibiting diarrhea or inhibiting coughs or giving an antiemetic to keep vomit in the stomach when it wants to get out. We have to consider these things carefully. And uh, I think uh, there's no real debate that paracetamol, so acetaminophen or Tylenol in the States is, is overused. So delighted you're doing well, uh, Richard. Thank you for the report. Um, do feel free to update us. And uh, that's all for today. Thank you for watching.